I want to, to sort of focus today on getting to grips with your soil, probably quite literally. Um, I know that the focus in the systems that we're talking about is in the producing really good quality feed, that intimate relationship there between plants, but particularly between the physical, chemical, and biological aspects of the soil, getting those in balance to get healthy grassland soils that produce um, healthy forest, uh, forage. A recent DEFRA-funded survey, of course, has shown that only 40% of fields are in good structural condition. And you'll have seen pictures like this one before, I suspect. The risk of compaction under the feet of animals and under the wheels of tractors is quite significant. And perhaps one of the, the largest weight risks on a field are things like silage trailers when they're fully laden, often because we're, we're in and working on fields when perhaps the moisture content isn't absolutely ideal. And it's compaction that's really driven a focus on improving the health of soils, particularly in terms of managing water balance and then allowing soils to absorb water and to become resilient, both in terms of water absorption and water supply to crops and particularly in this context of forage. Everybody's soil is their own. It's one of those really odd things where actually a soil in any field, in fact in any part of any field, is unique. It's the result of an intimate mixing, intimate balance between the soil forming factors in that place. So the underlying geology or rock at the bottom breaks down through the interaction with water, to some extent with biology, and that material begins to break down and form the soil above. And at the same time, biology starts to act from the top, in the first instance with very young soils, not big plants, but things like lichens and mosses. But then as we go through the successional system, the roots of plants interact to change and shape this upper horizon of the soil through roots through additions of organic matter, creating that darker topsoil layer. But everybody's soil is different. Your soil in your place is unique. In fact, your soil in any one place, field to field, is unique. It will have some things that are the same, but also some things that are different. And that means each soil needs to be understood by the people who are managing it. And that, that's important, because understanding soil is about understanding its resilience to damage, how much stick it can take during a typical year and during untypical years too. And that's a, a combination, a result of a combination of factors. There's some things that are out of the control of farmers, the texture of the soil, which is inherited dominantly from that underlying geology, the parent material that the soil is formed from. The proportion of sand, silt, and clay is, is something that you don't have a lot of control over, but something that it's important to understand and be able to work with. Things like buffering capacity, how well a soil holds and mediates liming, for example, is, is a property that's partly a result of those inherited characteristics, the mineralogy of the soil, the surface area of those particles. But it also results partly from management that's happened on that soil over hundreds of years. Things like water movement and the way water is able to move down through the soil, and things like soil fertility are much more directly an outcome of management. So it's this blend between management in situ, both recent and long term, and the inherent properties of the soil in any particular place that really need to be got to grips with if um, good soil management is really going to take place, and that we're going to have healthy grassland soils that produce really healthy and high quality forage. So I am guessing that most of you would be using or recommending that farmers use soil analysis. But it's really important that that is put into context. It's important that we understand when we're sending soils away for analysis what questions we want that soil analysis to answer. If you're interested in why a particular part of a field is yielding well when another part isn't yielding so well, you need to take separate samples of those parts and send them away separately. I think that's pretty obvious. But also, if we're interested in the nutrients that are available to particular uh, to plant roots, it's important that our sample respects and understands how the roots are working in the soil. So often, a soil analysis might show quite high 
um, availability of uh, nutrients, but the plants look like they're suffering for lack of it. And it's only when we're able to dig a hole and have a look that we're able to see that actually the plant roots aren't seeing the whole of the soil. So then the better question might be, particularly if the soil's um, not easily remediated, what, the, what are the nutrients in the bit of the soil that the plant roots see? I guess the other important question is what you do with results. Um, everybody's going much better. I used to always be able to tease farmers when I went onto farms because they would have a pile of um, soil analysis results in the corner of, um, of their office, beautifully filed, but filed in, in a pile with them all together and not at all linked up to things like what the fertilizer management strategy was on the field in any particular year or what the yield had been. So that linking of the results from soil analysis back to the kinds of uh, information that farmers have otherwise to hand grazing days, how well uh, livestock are doing, and so on, are really important. So it's your soil analysis, so you need to make it work for you. I guess the important thing, and the most important thing, is how the sample is taken. Because your soil analysis, if we're talking about routine soil analysis, represents only the sample that you're collecting and the day that it's taken. It's why some attention is always given in, in manuals like RB209 to how to get a good representative sample and, and the recommendation is to make sure that if we're trying to represent a whole field that we mix samples together. We collect and bulk so that we have a very good average from a single sample, a composite sample. But it's worth spending at least a little bit of time thinking about where in a field sample or which field, the depth and when in the year that the sample should be taken. And it's really important that if a, soil, if a field has a number of clearly distinct soil types in it, and I've worked in the Cotswolds where there are often three or four really different from the most sandy to the most clay soil, even in the same field, it doesn't make sense to bulk and mix those soils together. They, you'll end up with an average that isn't like anything that's in the actual field. So it's really important that the samples that are, that are collected the holes that are dug are actually representative of the field. And that's, that's the key thing, that they allow you to answer the question that you yourselves are, are asking. So the sample that's taken and, and sent away for analysis um, would be sieved to remove the stones that are outside the bag and put through r routine soil analysis. And I suspect you're all really used to this, but it's, it's really important to start with this kind of getting the chemistry right, or at least looking at the chemistry. Because actually, pH is really very critical for biological activity, for grass growth, and for root development. pH is really very important. Below pHs of five, and certainly down around four and a half, um, aluminium starts becoming toxic in the soil, and, and really starting to restrict both biological activity and root growth. And so a soil that is on average a pH of about five will have zones where actually the pH is much lower than that and that the productivity of the grass, the health of the soil might be being held back. And that's why the recommended pH uh, target, the pH for grass, is around six. Though, of course, we must take account of the fact that peaty soils will never be able to get that high. For the soil nutrient reserves, we talk about index two, remembering that index two for K actually is split across a wider range, and so we tend to talk about index two minus. For magnesium, particularly in a grassland system, keeping an eye on index two is really quite important, particularly where there's a risk of that imbalance disorder, hypermagnesemia. Um, and also note here the importance of thinking about texture. So particularly for the cation nutrients, potassium and magnesium actually, it will be hard for a soil with low buffering capacity, a sandy soil, to hold on to those nutrients very effectively. So the target index, the amount that the soil can hold, probably won't be able to be as high, and, and consequently RB209 recognizes that. I think it's important to say that it's really important to have enough calcium and magnesium for plant requirements, for grazing livestock requirements in the forage. But there is no evidence that the balance between those nutrients is important if both are sufficient. And that's, that's both from a, a livestock health and a soil health perspective. There is no evidence 
there's, a, there's very strong evidence that both are needed, and there's very strong evidence that both are needed to, in a sufficient amount, but that the balance between them isn't particularly critical. Both are cationic nutrients, both are held on the soil surface, both promote the clay particles to the jargon is flocculate to hold together. They're both the nutri uh, cations that promote good, strong structure. And so actually having enough of both is the important thing, not particularly the balance between them. And I think perhaps the more important thing in terms of managing soil fertility is having that attention to thinking about inputs and outputs at the rotational level for each field. Soil sampling and analysis used as a way of checking whether that management system that's in place is appropriate. A piece of work that we've just recently been doing in the Healthy Grassland Soils project has dominantly focused on the visual assessment of soils, putting together some of that chemistry with what we can see when we get out that tool from the garden shed where it's stored and often does look as clean as that, and, and take it out into the field so that it becomes not a, a tool shed tool, but actually a a tractor cab or a, a, a Land Rover cab tool. And that's not that's about getting the soil out and having a look at it, but also handling it and starting to break it apart. And the kinds of things that we're particularly able to look at in that context is how the soil structure is working. A really healthy soil where water is able to move freely through it will have natural aggregates that are, tend to be rounded with relatively large spaces between them and small pores within the aggregates. And the structure, and it's very idealized, I know, like the one on the left of the screen, is one that um, would allow water to penetrate quickly into the soil and then move down through. But also, as it is held in the soil, also be absorbed into these aggregates and be held ready for plant roots to take it up. The other stylized example shows what happens when that zone of compaction, and this one probably at a depth that results from the, the hooves of cows, is really quite intense. And those rounded units become flattened and platy. And what that means is that water and plant roots coming through here suddenly get to a zone where it's actually quite difficult to find a way through. Literally, it becomes like a maze. And the strength of the roots might not be enough to push their way through. An example from a field here, it's actually from a gate, which we took specifically to show the, the problem, but that very strong horizontal crack there when that soil profile is lifted out, and a really strong evidence of the roots not being able to penetrate down, but beginning to have to work to go sideways, explore along rather than up and down. And, and those horizontal lines are the things that immediately make me go when I dig a soil, a soil pit and start lifting and handling soil. And those horizontal lines, and that's a really, really classic example of really compacted clay soil, deliberately chosen, of course. The whole field wasn't like that. But to give us a real sense of how bad things can get. And sometimes it's useful in a field to start by looking at places where we know there's likely to be damage so that we can see and, um, and understand how the particular soil in the particular location will start to look when it's damaged. Digging a, a hole is, sounds a really simple thing. It is a relatively simple thing, but if you want a block of soil that you can handle and, and, and look at, the um, Healthy Grassland Soils uh, Project, the um, field guide and the pocketbook show you or talk you through the process of, of using a spade carefully to loosen out a soil block rather than just to get some soil out of the ground. 
though we would recognize straight away, I think, that, that we needed perhaps to take some remedial action if we wanted grass to grow in that area. The focus of the, the project has been to think about this in the context of limiting layers. Often a soil has good structure and bad, poor, poorer structure together inside a soil profile. And it's the most poor structure that will tend to limit production in that um, area. And so it's important if a, 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 a soil um, spadeful of soil has a number of different zones in it that we, we look and we think about which one is likely to limit production most. And that can come in, as this slide shows, in, in all sorts of directions and all sorts of ways. The limiting layer might be at the surface with good structure below. It might be at the, the in fact, the limiting layer might come further down. And it's really important that we look and examine that um, carefully. The, the structure scores, I think, in the, in the, the pocketbook that is now available for download, and I'm sure Debbie will tell you all about later, um, are relatively easy to use, particularly because they, they give you both clues in words and also the pictures against which you might compare. But the key for those compact soils is, is that they're compact, is that they're difficult to break down, but also that the aggregates or the blocks that form in the soil tend to be not rounded, which is the result of natural soil forming processes, but squared off. And there may still be worm activity and worm holes in the center of those aggregates. But in general, you'll have large aggregates with relatively little porosity in between, and they will be difficult to break down. One of the tricks that I use in a field um, when I'm thinking about or out with a farmer looking at soil structure is to actually benchmark what my soil could look like both against those bad areas in wheelings or in gateways, but also along a hedge line. So that the soil here we know is relative, much less disturbed, will have received much higher inputs of organic matter. And simply digging the same sort of hole here can give you an aspirational target. Very aspirational, but nonetheless something that this tells you, this is how good my particular soil in my particular location could become. And not, not always, but most often, I think in 95% of cases, the soil under a particular hedge line of more than 10 years old will show really good quality structure and is usually noticeably darker. It has higher organic matter content than the soil um, towards the center of the field. The kind of things that you should also be looking for, of course, as you dig and look and start to handle soils and put together with the chemistry and physics are some of the biology that's driving that process. And there are some now some really nice field guides easily available um, for identifying worm species and starting to, to become real worm naturalists if that's what you want. But the key here is about worm activity and whether worm activity is taking place in soils. The food web within a soil is complex. There are as many organisms below ground in UK agricultural soils as there are above ground in the, in the Amazon rainforest. So the biodiversity below the, our feet is huge. And the main differences between agricultural soils here on the right and natural soils on the left isn't actually the total amount of organisms. So in first sight, that might look like the most, it might look like the soil on the left has loads more things going on. But it's actually more to do with the zonation of that activity. So there are usually smaller and simpler populations, fewer and fewer different types of organisms in an agricultural soil. But the other thing is that they're spread over a greater depth. So that as a soil um, is mixed in agriculture, what happens, the plant roots, as well as cultivations, take organic matter and are able to mix it to a much greater depth in the soil than would ever happen in a, a semi-natural system. And this biodiversity is important because it actually drives key processes that are happening within soils. Those organisms interact with one another. They do that because they are trying to live. One thing eats another thing eats another thing. 
very few of the organisms in the soil can make their own energy. So like us, they're reliant on going shopping for food. In this case, they're just hanging around around the surface where plant residues might turn up, or around roots, which either as living roots or as decaying roots will be um, broken down and eaten by the soil organism. And there are two dominant ways or starting points for that breakdown process. The, the simple soluble sugars, the McDonald's of the um, soil organic matter world, are broken down dominantly by bacteria. And it's the tougher residues the more lignified, tougher roots that the fungi tend to operate on. And in most agricultural systems, as a consequence, because there's more softer, easier to eat food around, no big woody roots and so on, the ecosystem tends to be dominated by what we would, might call in the jargon the bacterial channel, the bacteria and the things that eat bacteria. But actually, all soils have a good residual population of decomposing fungi and fungi too that are able to cheat the system a little bit in that they form an association directly with the plant roots and, and fish for the simple soluble sugars just as the plants produce them. Those are the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that, that form huge networks and associations and can link between plants below ground and facilitate nutrient transfer. But it's this process, this bacteria acting on the plant residues, the bacteria being eaten by protozoa or nematodes, those nematodes being eaten by other nematodes or mites. This complex war of attrition below ground, that's the one that releases nutrients. Because the bacteria are quite conservative. They like to keep most of the nutrients for themselves. And it's only when they're chewed on and chased down by the protozoa and bacterial feeding nematodes and other larger organisms that those nutrients start to become available. There is an important role for the larger organisms, too, in comminution. It just means chewing. I don't know why science needs to invent long names, but it does. So this just means that these organisms come in, and on those fresh plant materials, will tend to chew them up and break them down into smaller units, increasing their surface area and the accessibility for the bacteria. Notice on this diagram, the earthworms sit up over here. They're a bit, well, dull. They the pacifists, they don't get involved in the wars below ground because they're vegetarians. They um, solely are looking for flat, fresh and active, recently added plant residues to um, form their diet. They're also quite easily disrupted by tillage. So we tend to see sh more shorter and more juvenile earthworms in fields that are in a regular rotation that includes some tillage in comparison to in permanent pasture systems. It's a bit complicated, this understanding soils, which is lucky because it keeps me in a job. But we have to consider how plant factors, the physical factors in the soil, the chemical factors in the soil, and the biological factors in the soil all interact with one another to drive the functions of the soil. And it's the result of all these interactions that means that things like nitrogen is released from the organic matter as it's broken down, or phosphorus is supplied from the minerals of the soil through a combination of biological and chemical processes. And those processes are also affected, of course, by climate and, um, in the context of soil fertility, nutrient input management practices. And those two factors will also drive and interact with the system. So it's not always easy to, when you're looking at the the complexity of a grassland system, to put your finger on it and say it's this one thing, just this, that will fix it. It's why it's important to try and take that holistic view where the whole soil is looked at and understood. And it's in that context that understanding how soil life can then work for you is important. I think there isn't and there will never be a magic spray or a magic bullet in relation to soil biology. The key there is a bit like the livestock above ground, that having the right habitat, the places for them to live, that structure where there's a good balance of air and water, space for them to move about, plant roots for them to associate with, but also the food, the regular inputs of organic matter. And in grassland systems, that dominantly means the cycling below ground of um, roots, but also the inputs through grazing livestock, 
um, through additions such as manures and so on. And it isn't quite as simple as to say, if you build it, they will come. But it, it almost is. The key and the, the underpinning rules that come out every time when we review and look at this literature is that what's really needed to make soils healthy and to support that healthy and active biology that can drive the system is that there are three rules. To increase organic matter inputs, the more food there is, the more activity of these organisms there will be. To reduce tillage intensity, the one at the bottom, and in grassland systems that's not always so important, but most grassland systems do often include some tillage phases, and it's important to just think about how those are used and when those are used and to use them carefully. But also to think about plant diversity, and I don't just mean mixed swards for grazing and conservation, it might be about trees in fields, agroforestry, it might be about actually the diversification and the use of mixed crops for whole crop silage and so on. And that plant diversity is being recognized as being quite important because it stimulates organisms that have particular associations with particular plants. It helps to support different kinds of arbuscular mycorrhiza through the um, rotation and, and into the grassland systems, for example, but also can create real advantages above ground too, and that's a, diff a different day's conversation about the advantages of mixed species swards in terms of their, their benefits in terms of um, micronutrient uptake and consequently for um, uh, livestock health. So I could witter on and on and on. Um, I like this picture because without thinking about it, the farmer's showing me how much he loves his soil. Um, and I think just that very picture of that handling and, and understanding and breaking apart the soil to look at it, it's probably the most important thing. So for me, it's the spade, the hands, and then the chemical analysis that are most important. Just at the moment, we don't have good analytical tools to recommend in terms of the soil biology. What we can say and what we, we do recommend is that you should keep your eyes open, particularly for that earthworm activity. And, and through the good systems orientated management of reducing tillage intensity and put it thinking about organic matter management through crops and inputs that we're able to stimulate and develop more healthy grassland soils for the organisms that live in them, but also for the livestock and ultimately to produce products for us too. There's an awful lot of people whose work I've borrowed. I've shown pictures and some of you might have recognized Paul Newell Price digging the holes earlier on. And Paul Hargreaves' hands were in there earlier too, um, handling and breaking apart some soil. And so there's been a really big team of us from SRUC and ADAS working on the Healthy Grassland Soils project. Um, and I'm going to be looking forward to uh, hearing and responding to your questions. Thank you very much for listening.